Any of you who tried running tests, end-to-end uh, -end tests on your system, uh, probably know how frustrating it can be to devote a significant part of your time uh, to um, just to later realize that, you, that, you do, that you've done something that you just can't trust. I'm going to present to you uh, how we solve major issues on end-to-end -end testing for mobile and um, Mostly uh, for uh, React Native, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, for mobile in general and for React Native uh, specifically. Uh, so for those of you, um, hi, I'm Rotem. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, recently a group of uh, engineers split from OneApp and formed the Mobile Guild core team. Uh, we own the, uh, the mobile stack at Crosswix. We mainly do infrastructure work. And uh, we devote a uh, lot of our time um, for uh, testing infrastructure and methodologies. And most of our work is, uh, is open source. Um, our story starts with OneApp. That's the official application, uh, uh, the official uh, iOS and Android uh, application uh, for, uh, for Wix. Uh, we started working on OneApp about uh, 14 months ago. Um, on March 2016. Uh, in terms of, of engineering efforts, this, is, uh, this app is a cross-company uh, effort. We currently incorporate, corporate, currently, um, corp incorporate code from five different mini-companies. Uh, there are currently 35 developers on the, on the project, and uh, most of the code is written in JavaScript. And uh, having we have a release train. Uh, having Google Play and Apple App Store as our means of distribution, OneApp is inherently not continuous deployment. Uh, so we use a release train, uh, one platform each week. Uh, but the distribution mechanism is not what really, it's not the real reason why we don't do continuous deployments. Because we we'll rely on manual testing a lot. So currently, the full regression, uh, the, full, um, the full QA uh, regression test suite contains 300 tests. And since it's so big, um, we can't finish testing uh, at, on time before the next release. So we only do uh, 70 uh, tests instead of the 300, uh, which also take lots of time, about three days. Uh, so, in fact, it still takes, it takes us so much time uh, to, to, to do this. So, instead of, of running the... Uh, there's so much uh, queued up... I'm sorry. Uh, instead of... It takes us so much time uh, to test. So, when we finish testing, so much is queued up on master that we cannot take the latest changes and we just do an RC branch and run on that. So, we find that there is an issue here. The QA test suit uh, will always grow, meaning that even if development continues at the same pace, uh, QA will always have additional work. This means that we'll either have to hire more QA or just give up on some tests like we do. Mobile development at Wix grows at around 25% uh, in per quarter, and the pace is only increasing. And, and management understands that we need to invest in tooling rather than in manual testing. So let's take a simplified example. If development goes at the same pace of two features per, um, uh, per, uh, per week, or two bug fixes per week, uh, that's, the, that's the pink line. Uh, then, then this means that QA will have two features to test on the first week, and it will have, uh, the, the test suite will be seven times bigger. Oops. Seven times bigger uh, on the seventh week. So add a growing product to the mix, and the problem gets even much harder, because you hire more developers, and you start, uh, you, you increase the, the um, 
at the time, that you increase the features that you write per week, and it just blows up. So what will save us from that abomination? Automated tests. So this is the testing pyramid. Since everybody in this room, I guess, uh, already know why tests are so important and understand that the different types of tests will not focus on, on what each test does, or, um, and we'll rather, uh, we'll rather explain how we do that. So we'll just break down E2E uh, into two parts, E2E, which means testing just like a user, meaning uh, with real survey data, connecting to the server and getting everything back, and UI, pure UI autom automation, meaning uh, no, not testing external services, uh, just testing how the UI works. So let's focus, focus on mobile development and on React Native specifically. So unit testing is pretty easy. Business logic is mostly in JavaScript. Uh, it's easy to test in Node. These are uh, the libraries that are written there are libraries that uh, we developed in-house uh, just to help us define unit testing methodologies uh, in React Native, and actually in React. Component testing it is also something that we do. It's also uh, being tested with Node. Uh, we, can re we rely on Enzyme by Airbnb, and Enzyme Drivers, uh, which is a mocking library that was written in-house as well. But what about UI automation and E2E? E2E was always hard, like we said before. It, was, it, was, it wasn't as, as trustworthy as all the other, others. So why is it so hard? Why isn't it uh, trustworthy? E2E tests are often considered flaky um, on all platforms, on web, on iOS, and on Android. And um, this, this is because tests um, may fail with no code, code changes at all. And or this happens because there are many moving parts inside the application. You can uh, things running inside the application are not synchronized, not inherently synchronized with each other. So execution can can just um, uh, can just finish execution of different threads can, can finish uh, on uh, different times uh, on each run. And uh, so we can't really sure when the application is idle. Uh, users of E2E frameworks uh, often deal with synchronization manually. So they just uh, add slip functions scattered around their code. So this is an example I took from Aaron Stock on React Amsterdam uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this is actually what we've done to try preventing flakiness. Uh, just take a look at this away driver slip. This means that we try to find to see if there is a, uh, if a view is presented, and if it is presented, we just wait and see if it's presented again after 50 milliseconds, and then again and again for 20, 20 times. Which is uh, is that the best way we is that the best way we can do uh, uh, um, uh, synchronization with the application? Let's see. So let's get back to flakiness. How unreliable a flaky test suit is. Um, let's calculate the probability of test suit to fail. So uh, Q is the probability to a fail test. Uh, mi one minus Q is uh, the probability of a uh, one minus Q is the probability of a single test to succeed. Uh, one minus Q times n is the probability of the entire test suit to succeed. And y, one minus all that is the probability of at least one test uh, to fail, which will fail our test suit, of course. So if a test is flaky of 0.5% of times, if we have 20 tests, then, well, you'll see. Uh, if we have 50 tests, then uh, only, almost even more than fifth of times our test suit will fail. And if we have 100 tests, well, you get the point. It's very unreliable. So this is a complex issue, and there are frameworks around that try dealing with it, uh, with, uh, with, with E2E on, on mobile. So there is Appium. 
This is the most popular solution, and that this, this is the fa de facto standard in the industry. We also checked uh, with big companies in Israel. That's what they do. Most of them actually do manual testing, but those who do uh, E2E use, uh, use Appium. So the internals of Appium, uh, the driver of Appium is, um, is implemented using instruments on iOS and uh, UI Automator on Android. And this is essentially an um, external way to interact with the application, just like a user does, which, is, which could be a good thing, uh, if you think about it, because it actually mimics a user. Um, so we've used Appium for eight months, and um, we've had We've had our fair share of, uh, of great time with Appium. Uh, we had, um, the major problems we had were, uh, one, uh, testing in CI was, didn't, uh, we didn't have the same results as running on, on our computers. Uh, essentially because the CI has different uh, performance than our computers. Um, usually, it's, it's uh, much, um, usually our computers are much stronger than, than the CI. And uh, it can also be running something else in the background. And uh, essentially, um, the computer is maybe busier or slower. And so just to get past the flakiness, we would uh, add slip functions around uh, to, get, to get flaky tests to, uh, to work. Uh, Apple Instruments tool uh, is limited to performing only one action per second. So there is a hack for that, which is al already unmaintained. It is called Instruments Without Delays. And essentially what it does is removes this, uh, uh, this limit, and then it enables us to, to run faster on, uh, uh, with instruments. But again, we, we would have to wait for the hack to be published after a new version of Xcode is, is, um, uh, is uh, being released. Uh, so uh, this made us wait for that. And um, our team had 60 tests, uh, which took around 10 minutes, and which, is, which is quite long. It, it's also worth noting Magneto. It is um, my experience with work, working on uh, E2E framework, um, in-house E2E framework on my previous company I, w I uh, worked for. It's a small um, in-house solution by Everything Me uh, on top of UI Automator. Uh, it was a bit more stable, we, um, but we still could not eradicate flakiness. And um, we were 12 developers, and uh, one was just sitting on the CI system, always trying to fix uh, flaky tests. And, and still, we got only 5 to 10 percent false negatives. Um, we still got 5 to 10 percent false negatives. So essentially, both these platforms are black box. What is black box testing? It's a method of testing things from the outside. Uh, instead of, of uh, without knowing what's going on internally. In mobile, uh, black box E2E essentially means that, uh, that the framework goes over the UI hierarchy and the view hierarchy, and it looks for an element, and if it can find it, it slips, and then tries again, and, and just going looping like that until a certain timeout. Uh, and, um, and then it interacts with the view. Uh, same principles also apply to black box and to end testing frameworks uh, for web. So E2E gets even more flaky on, on mobile when we use React Native applications. So let's just take a brief look on, on how things are rendered in, in mobile applications. So in native apps, there is only one thread the UI thread, uh, which is uh, responsible for uh, building all the, all the UI. In React Native, it's a bit trickier, because there is something that we call a virtual DOM, like, like a virtual DOM in web. And, and the unique architecture 
adds much more complexity. And uh, because now we have another thread that is rendering something. And when it finishes rendering it, it passes everything. It passes uh, instructions that are um, asynchronous over the bridge to the native uh, to, to render act the actual view. And uh, so now we have two threads that are actually doing rendering. And black box frameworks had much, much harder time uh, working with React Native. So we worked with Appium on React Native, and it was very hard for, that, for us uh, to work with it. So for us, black box was, was a dead end. And we had to find a new approach. And this approach is gray box testing. Redbox essentially is, is a piece of code that is planted inside the application to see what's going on, and it has an, the knowledge of what's going on inside the application. So how, how it gathers all that? So unlike Blackbox, uh, Graybox runs in the same process. It has access to the memory, and it can communicate with other threads. And uh, being able to read the internal memory, it can see uh, what's going on if there are uh, network requests in flight if the, um, if the main thread is, uh, is not busy, is idle now, and other threads uh, idle. And essentially, we can do whatever we want. We can write custom code that can, that can check if the application is idle or not for us. And um, so that would, so we can also sync with the main thread. So this means that when we interact with the application, we, we know that if we run th stuff, because everything is actually rendered on the main thread, uh, when we do our tapping or clicking with interaction with the application on gray box testing tools, um, we know that, uh, that this action that we perform will, will be on, on this, um, will happen without anything on the background interrupting the main thread. But there are also downsides. Uh, usually, gray box testing uh, frameworks uh, have to plant uh, code inside the application. And so it has to go through a different uh, compilation process. So this is not, we're not shipping exact, exactly our production app. Uh, we're not testing that our production app. We're testing a different type, a different variant of that application. OK. so. There are gray box solutions for mobile out there. And the leader of mobile gray box testing frameworks is Google today. And um, Google have created Espresso about four years ago. And that's the biggest gray box solution out there today. It's an E2E framework uh, for, uh, for Android. And it's very popular today. There are many. Um, it, it is integrated inside Android Studio. Uh, there are many CI systems that support uh, Espresso out of the box. And even Firebase has like this freaking huge device cloud uh, that lets you run Espresso tests on, on real devices. But it's still not cross-platform. And there is also Earl Grey. Uh, that's the Espresso for iOS. It's essentially the same architecture uh, for iOS, also by Google. And, uh, but it's not as popular yet. And it has its own issues uh, of being um, very, um, uh, being, it's, it's very hard uh, today to, uh, to have, to run through the setup phase in Xcode and running on CI can be a bit tricky. Um, so these frameworks are gray box frameworks and they, they essentially they are, are inherently synchronized uh, with the application. They can only interact when a, they will only interact with an application when it's idle. And why is that important? So let's talk a bit about how it is getting synchronized. Idling resources is the underlying synchronization mechanism uh, used uh, by Espresso and Earl Grey. And the way it works is instead of going over the UI hierarchy, like we've seen before in black box testing frameworks, it, uh, it just uh, queries internal resources. And, uh, and, and if it gets a yes from all of them, 
it just expects or performs the action. If no, it just loops uh, for a very short amount of time, like a few milliseconds. And uh, so th the biggest surprise about these frameworks is that not only they are very, very stable, uh, they are much, much faster. Like five to ten times faster than traditional black box testing frameworks. But they are still not cross-platform. Uh, using Espresso and L Grey, uh, well, it, they, they forced us to write our tests in Java or Objective-C, and they're preventing them from being cross-platform. Um, and when considering React Native, it actually sets the barrier to entry much higher uh, for developers. And still, they're essentially just drivers for interaction with the application. They cannot support uh, deep linking, and they can support mocking of user notifications. And so that's uh, Detox. It, it's, Detox simplifies all that. The axioms that led us to the current architecture of Detox are we want things to be gray box, because we know gray box will be um, much, um, much more performant and will not be as flaky as black box. And uh, so we'll take the best gray box drivers out there, gray, um, Espresso and Earl Grey. And uh, although, uh, well, it is cross-platform, but although we're not, uh, Android is not fully implemented yet, we're working on it, um, we'll add awareness to the architecture of, of React Native. So, um, so our gray box testing framework can synchronize with the internals of React Native. We also believe that uh, writing tests should be with as less boilerplate as possible. So scripting languages are a perfect fit. And also, uh, we write the code, React Native code, mostly in JavaScript, so writing code in the same language is also a big bonus for us. We chose to create um, both the tester, the test runner, and the, the testee, the device, uh, WebSocket clients, which are much more robust than, uh, server, than client server architecture. And, um, and the, the matching uh, is using, using an Airglare and Espresso, uh, we were forced to match inside the device. Um, actually, it, it makes sense um, because the tests become much, much faster. So let's take a look on a simple test. Uh, that's actually a test uh, written in Detox. So, uh, oh, I have this one. Let's use it. So uh, there's no need to, um, to synchronize. No need to add slip functions anywhere because uh, the uh, Detox will, is inherently synchronized because it is gray box. So actions will be executed uh, when only when the application is idle. So we just use a wait on them. We can control React Native lifecycle, uh, which makes the tests much, much faster because we can restart. Instead of restarting the whole application, we can only restart uh, the React Native part of it if we use React Native. Uh, the Test code is unaware of the platform it uses. Uh, so we can later add uh, support for uh, Android or uh, Windows Phone. We won't, probably. Uh, but, uh, but we won't have to rewrite our tests or write new tests. Uh, this example is actually uh, with uh, running with Mocha. Um, but we can run with, every, with any test runner that we want. And it's debuggable. Uh, I don't know if any of you have used uh, Appium or, uh, or a Protractor, uh, but this means that these breakpoints will actually work like they are supposed to. Um, other frameworks do that, um, their synchronization using uh, uh, a promise queue, and uh, Detox uses actually the native construct, the async await native construct, uh, and that actually waits um, for the for everything to finish before it continues to the same to the to the next line. 
So let's take a look uh, high, on a higher level diagram of, uh, and, and see and, and try to understand how detox works. So we have the API level, which is, oh, I can't really see that, um, but we have the API level, which is just like uh, the test we saw before. Uh, that's a line that is, uh, when it's being executed, it is being converted into a JSON, uh, a nested invocation JSON, which, uh, which is then being sent over the WebSocket client uh, of the tester uh, to, the, uh, to the testee. And then it is being invoked uh, through method reflection to the driver. It actually uh, starts the, the driver, the Earl Grey and R extensions on, on Detox. And the uh, invocation is blocky, so nothing changes beneath our feet. Uh, and then the result is being returned, and only then the, uh, the, um, the await is being resolved. Uh, so that's how it is synchronized with uh, with a test T. So this is oh come on. <laughs> uh, I'll have to grant access here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just hang on a moment. Boom. Great. Thank you. In fact, it is so fast that it runs the the detox uh, full test suit uh, full. Uh, um, Test project suit, uh, there are 54 tests in less than three minutes. So the, the top features uh, that we have in Detox, uh, it's the first gray box ETOE framework uh, with support for React Native. It is synchronized with it. Uh, we can write tests on cross-platform cross tests. And uh, we can write tests in the same language that we actually uh, write our production code with. We can handle deep links, uh, both from starting the application from a deep link and from the background. We can uh, mock user notifications, uh, uh, both calendar, location, push notifications. We can handle permission dialogues something that is, uh, that is missing in, in both, um, I, I think, in all the, the others. So let's go back to our testing pyramid. Uh, so now we have a stable framework, end-to-end uh, -end framework, uh, but it may still be flaky uh, due to network, uh, network and server issues. Um, so if you want to... Um, if we can run pure UI automation or, uh, without, uh, with expected requests and responses, um, we, we, can, we can do much better. So uh, we need to provide a mocking mechanism and somehow for React Native to do that. So that's exactly what we did with React Native Repackager. Uh, essentially, it's, a, it's an NPM package that patches React Native Packager and uh, adds, uh, um, adds a way to, uh, to add custom extensions to React Native and bundle your, um, mocking, your mock files inside the, instead of the, of the production files. So mocking repackager uh, turns Detox into a um, pure UI automation framework uh, as well. So pyramid is all green. No excuses, uh, we can start testing. So we use Detox in our dev flow today. Uh, there are already three modules that are heavily relying on Detox, uh, drastically lowering the need for manual testing. Uh, OneApp Container uses Detox. Uh, we now got to a point that we can run minimal setup on uh, multiple CI solutions. We can run Detox on both Travis CI and on local and inside Wix on uh, Team City, um, and also I want to credit to give a credit to the CRM team for writing the first test ever in Detox on um, production. You're great guys. <laughs> Thank you for being the best big guinea pigs ever. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
how we scale now, or how are we, how are we going to see uh, uh, scaling uh, our uh, mobile products? So tests are going to be coupled to features and bug fixes, and developer, developers will write their own tests, not automation and QA guilds. Uh, they will not write new features. Uh, they will only write our uh, regression test suite that is already, already exists. Uh, each module uh, of one app uh, can create its own suite of tests, and it has its own build process in CI. So it is decoupled from everything else. Uh, so when it's published as an NPM package, um, it's already tested. And so now tests are much closer to the code. So instead of running a nightly uh, test suite, which then you just don't know which commit did any problem, uh, we can, we can, developer can actually have feedback of a after a few, in a matter of minutes, not hours or day. Uh, so Detox is a TDD project. Uh, it has 100% code coverage. Uh, it is uh, set to set, uh, the build is set to fail if it gets lower than that. Uh, so um, uh, the builds run on Travis CI, and only, and, and, and only contributions that meet uh, our uh, standard are accepted. Uh, and we also run the entire Detox API on a special test app uh, um, on every build, so we can test our own API on uh, when we run uh, when we run builds. And also, Detox is open source. It is uh, it is open source from the first commit with already 260 stars under the radar. We never spoke about it externally. Uh, it already has users outside of Wix and also contributors outside of Wix, not on, not, and not readme's uh, actual code. Uh, we've just finalized the first stable release, and we're going to announce it on React Europe in uh, two weeks from now. So, oh, you can see the collaborations. You can see so. Uh, so you can guess. Uh, we're already talking about collaboration with Microsoft. Uh, they have a new CI solution that is called Mobile Center. They want Detox in. Uh, Airbnb is uh, talking with us about uh, working on together on Detox for Android. Uh, also, uh, there were talks with the React Native Core team of adding Detox uh, to their core test suite. And uh, it is already has been tested by Exponent, uh, which is making Expo. Uh, and we're just getting started. Uh, so the roadmap uh, for uh, the future, I'll try to make it short. I have like three minutes. Yeah, OK. Um, so our API uh, supports addition. Um, it, it supports uh, multi-platforms. Uh, so it is built cross-platform in mind, so it will be much uh, easier for us to add Android without having our users um, creating uh, tests, especially for, uh, for a different platform. Uh, but we actually need to, still need to research how we integrate with React Native. Uh, and also, emulation, emulators, uh, running on emulators is not a trivial job because uh, emulators, uh, all the cloud solutions, uh, the CI cloud solutions, are heavily relying on virtual machines. And uh, x86 emulators for Android are virtual machines themselves. So, this, um, this forces us to look for an, uh, nested virtualization solutions. Uh, so, just a bit talking about how we maintain performance or how we want to maintain performance. Um, maintaining performance is hard because you don't really know uh, when, when a feature actually degrades your performance. It's very hard to understand um, to understand if you made an impact on performance, and uh, you can't improve, uh, you can't improve just by a hunch. You can't see if you had any implication on performance on based on on a hunch or on manual testing. Uh, so, and, and essentially, you can't improve uh, if you don't measure, and uh, you won't know if a feature degrades your performance unless you have something that tells you that. 
So, essentially that. You can't improve uh, what you can't measure. Just like analyzing your BI, uh, we must measure performance. So, inside our roadmap, uh, we want to add uh, support for uh, performance probing. Uh, which means measuring vital signs when running our tests, like CPU and memory footprint, launch time, size on disk, etc., uh, etc. Et and setting thresholds to the measurements, so we'd know that uh, if we passed a certain threshold, then the tests will fail. And we also want to compare me measurements to previous builds. So we'll have all the history of our builds, and we can see that just like in this graph, if you'll see, each, uh, each column is, is a different build, and uh, we will be able to see exactly which build and exactly which commit created the, uh, the performance hits. Um, so, that was it. Thank you. I have no time for questions, so don't ask anything. <laughs> Thank you, guys. No, no, you, you can ask questions, but where time is up anyway. No, it's not up? Okay, open for questions. Uh, the blonde guy there with the long hair. Okay, so Martinez asked, how are we going to, uh, to run on multiple platforms, Android and iOS? Uh, so we would, this would be your choice. You uh, will have your uh, script that runs on CI, and you will either run it on Android or on iOS. You can choose your configuration. So you, you detox run, a detox test uh, configuration iOS, detox run configuration Android after that. Um, we're thinking about sharding tests, uh, but I'm not sure yet how we would shard testing uh, between two platforms. So, um, so basically, yeah, just run your t tests one after the other. That's also, that's also a possibility. But then you will have to wait for, uh, the, exit, uh, for the exit code. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Are we able to run tests on real devices? Uh, so we're closed. Uh, we're, now we're running only on simulators. Uh, on Android, it won't be an issue, but on iOS, it's a bit of an issue because we want to do much more than just tapping and scrolling. We also want to, uh, to be able to uh, mock things like, uh, um, uh, like permissions. And uh, this is something that we can't do on real devices unless they're uh, rooted, so jailbroken. Uh, so testing on simulators is actually will make us be able to, to uh, do the full, uh, to, to have full features. So Avi is saying that running on simulators uh, may, um, may have significantly different performance than on real devices. Then you're right. Probably this is what we'll have. Uh, but this project inherently, um, we inherently want to, to benchmark it against itself. So if I'm running something on, uh, on, my, uh, on my current version, and then I'm doing changes, and I want to test it, so the next version will be tested uh, and will be uh, measured according to the previous version. Yeah. Uh, so Native, uh, native API calls may have uh, different implications. They may, may be faster on uh, devices and maybe slower on simulators and vice versa. Uh, I, guess, I guess this is something, usually it's vice versa. I guess uh, we'll, we will have that. Uh, but this is not, these are, I think these are edge cases, uh, mostly, mostly edge cases. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's a tool that should, that helps us doing stuff uh, faster, doing stuff uh, better. I guess it it doesn't cover everything, like everything else in life. Thank you, guys.